All right, everyone, just before we get started, there's a disclaimer that we have to go over. Um, some instructors read it, some have you read it, but just so we can cover ourselves. To receive the CE credit for this course, we have to sign in on the seminar roster and remain in person for a total of 50 minutes to receive full credit. If you do need to excuse yourself, you must sign out with the course moderator, which is Pam to my right, well, to my left if you're looking this way, and check in with the once you return. This course may only be taken one time for credit in a renewal period. State certificates are emailed within 15 days after the event. APIA members receive complimentary free CEs. Non-members will be invoiced $15 for CE admin fee. And of course, if you have any questions, you can contact Janice Disparry at the number or email listed on this form. So, out of all what we do in the emergency service industry, you as representatives of your client, I believe in my wholehearted profession that water and classes and categories is probably the most important topic that you're gonna learn to make yourself and maximize your claims for your clients. Reason being is the majority of them happen on a daily basis. Fires, although they are the big Hank Aaron home run, happen few and far between. And how many of you actually worked a fire in this room or have been have dealt with a client that has had a fire? Okay, and the, those of you that raise your hand have been doing this quite some time, correct? Now, before you got your first fire, how many water losses did you see? Multiple. Well, and see, that's what I was getting. Well, see, see, we've been around each other so many times. You took the words right out of my mouth. What do you need to put a fire out? So, <laughs> hey, are there any firefighters in here? That's, that's why you could say that. No, but um, <laughs> there you go. But basically, if you can't document and specify, especially the way the insurance carriers are being demanding as they are today, as opposed to not even just a year ago, they want to know the severity of the damage. They want to know what type of damage you're dealing with because they're now depending on you, they're depending on a client, they're depending on independence because they're not sending their people out anymore. They're not going to the house. So they want as much specified, documented damage that they can find. So first and foremost, what is water damage? Anyone have a clue? How about, I'll make it easy for you. Water damage is defined as any water that causes the usefulness of the future use or value of any property to become impaired by water. What that basically means is this is dry. When it gets wet, it's no longer the same that it was when it was dry. Okay. What now, what is water damage restoration? That is defined as the act or process of restoring and is not complete until brought back to pre loss or former state. So we have mitigation companies out there that say, like it never happened. Kind of looks like that green hat right there. Then you have companies that are like the one that I work for, CPR, that we want to actually get them back to pre-loss condition. How does that happen? You have to assess the damage and you have to work as quickly as possible because time is of the essence. Sam, you can go ahead and hit the next slide. Let's see where we are here. You can go again. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over the categories of water damage. There's three categories and then there's four classes. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break each one down because you're gonna to have to be able to identify and let the carrier know, let the adjuster know what exactly it is that you see when you get on scene. So let's start with 
the categories. Category one, and I'm going to read this verbatim because it's very imperative that you get it this way. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, those of you that are on Zoom, I will answer those questions at the end. So this way, Pam can type them all in and be a little bit more organized instead of trying to stop and start. So category one, this is water that originates from a sanitary, clean water source is the one that does not pose a substantial risk to humans from dermal ingestion and inhalation exposure. Basically, skin, ingest, breathing it in. Obviously, once water source contacts other surfaces and materials, its condition changes with time. And I'll explain that in a minute. As it dissolves or mixes with solids, soils, and other contaminants, examples of clean water sources may include, but are not limited to. Now, before I tell you these clean water sources, this is where you have to be very descriptive when you're dealing with the carrier. Because although it may come from a clean water source, it specifically says in the definition, you don't know what it's touched once it hits the area or the floor or the walls. So clean sources of water are appliance malfunction involving a water supply, accidental discharge. Broken toilet tanks and toilet bowls that do not contain contaminants or additives. Okay, so if a tank cracks or the water supply line from the toilet, everyone hears toilet and thinks, oh my God, that's category three automatically. Not necessarily. Broken water supply lines. This is the one that confuses people because it's outside. But falling rainwater, not which that flows over the ground or through multiple structural components. So falling rainwater meaning they left their window open, they left their door open without a screen, and the water comes in, wind-driven rain is a perfect example of how that water source can get into your home without touching the ground. Yes. And tub or sink overflows containing no contamination. So let's talk about those for a minute. You come in, first thing you're going to ask the homeowner is, where did it come from? And make sure that they talk to you first and not the carrier. Because what the carrier is going to try to do is get them to tell them, oh, well, there's no need to do any tear out or any type of mitigation other than drying process because it's clean water. This is why you have to be the guide for this claim. Now, it could traditionally just be a broken water pipe. It could be a broken supply line. This is why you have to communicate with your client. Now, nine times out of 10, I know most of you probably have some sort of personal relationship with the client, or you were referred by a personal relationship, which will then help you have a personal relationship with that client. So it's always imperative to communicate because you are the information gatherer for the claim. Category two, this is often referred to as gray water, okay? Now what gray water is, this is the water that contains significant chemical, biological, or physical contamination and has the potential to cause substantial discomfort or sickness if consumed by or contacted by humans and carries microorganisms or nutrients for the potential of microbial growth. Examples may be, but are not limited to, broken aquariums or punctured water beds. Everybody, well, there was a couple of people in there old enough to know what a water bed is, right? <laughs> Overflows from toilet bowls with some urine, but no feces. Now, I, I hear a lot of people raising their eyebrows. Urine, even if found in the carpet, is still considered category two. Even pet urine, it, it's all considered category two, okay? Overflows or discharges from washing machines or dishwashers. Reason why I say that is because the chemical agent inside the washing machine, the soap that you use to clean the clothes, is now mixed in with that water. Same thing with dishwasher. 
in seepage due to hydrostatic pressure. Does anyone in here know what hydrostatic pressure is? Okay, so basements, anything that's below ground level and they don't have a sump pump, that moisture has to go somewhere. So when you see that walls are bleeding, when you see that calcium deposit on the wall, or you see groundwater that has come up through the ground, if that water doesn't have a way to get pumped out, it's going to have to, it has to find somewhere to go. And that hydrostatic pressure is that pressure that is around the foundation of the home that will cause the water to come into the house. Now there's ways that you can get that covered if you have the right policy. If you don't, they're going to consider it groundwater and it's going to get denied. Now water saturated carpet, cushion, padding, underlayment always should be removed and disposed of when it has been saturated with category two or category three water. We didn't even read category three yet, but these are things that once you get on scene, we would appreciate as the mitigation company to know this information so we know what we're going to be dealing with when we get there. So the first thing that I'm going to always ask is, is it covered? What's the severity of the damage? And what kind of water are we dealing with? Because it's going to be determination of, are my guys coming in with some shop vacs and some, and some extractors, or are they putting the gloves on and getting dirty? And without, and finding that information out after you already get there, puts everyone at a bad spot. Because now we're not documenting, we're not on the same page as you, and now the carrier can find ch uh, chinks in the armor, so to speak. So if we're not a united front when we're working on these claims, we're gonna have some issues. Yes. This, this is where, um, we weren't having these issues two years ago, pre-COVID, because at some point, what was I always saying? What's going on? Everyone that's done a claim with me, we try to vet these out. If at any point that it's going to affect the time frame of us getting the mitigation done, then heck, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll get it done. We'll get there. But if, it, if it, the optimum, or a utopian way of looking at things, if we can get this information before we even dispatch, that's probably the best way because that's what's going to make the claim run smoother. Yes. No problem. Ab absolutely. And it's all about how you articulate. Oh, I'm sorry. The, thank you, Pam. I forgot about that. The, the question that Robert asked was, there's a fine line between category two and category three. We have to be able to determine when it becomes category two to category three. And ironically enough, I am getting ready to get into that part. But uh, to answer Robert's question is, we have to be able to articulate the difference and we have to know our categories because the category at that point, if you know what you're talking about, can be subjective and very hard for the carrier to disprove one or the other. Um, but once I read the, the definition of the category three, there's a lot of things that affect or determine what makes it from category two to category three. So what is category three? This is often referred to as black water Category three water always contains pathogenic and pathogenic is a disease causing agent. Grossly unsanitary or black water sources are those that arise from massive quantities of sewage or other contaminated waters entering into the structure, which has the likelihood of severe sickness if consumed or exposed to humans this is why I need to know about this category because now I'm sending guys into a situation where they could be caused to be made sick. Not that our guys should be wearing sneakers or unprotected footwear, but I've heard of instances that a guy had a ingrown toenail 
he stepped walking around and affected category three water. And because it appeared to be clear, although they call it black water, it's not always necessarily the color black. All of a sudden, get a fever, sick, couldn't figure out what's going on. It was just an ingrown toenail. Turn, turns out he got an infection because he was slopping around in category three water, but he didn't know because the homeowner didn't know because the person with, with the referral source didn't know or find out. So now, so when we don't know the answer to the question, we try to treat it as the worst case scenario so our guys are protected. But some of the examples of category three are ground surface water, rising water from streams or rivers that are, have an organic matter in them, obviously seawater of all forms, and sewage. That's the, that's the, that's the biggest one, sewage. Any type of sewage malfunction uh, because that is, ex that is expected to contain urine and feces, but it also can contain dangerous chemical or medical waste. Now, let's, let's rewind it back to Superstorm Sandy. We would go up to Manahawken. We would go up to uh, Seagirt, anywhere that was a beach town. Now, we, not only did we have ocean water, and bay water going into these people's homes, we had insurance carriers telling the homeowners that that water could be just dried out. They were leaving their furniture in there. They were, they were not doing any type of blood cutting. And for the most part, people didn't have electricity, so their homes weren't getting dried out properly either. A lot of people were lack of a better word, were very duped by the insurance carriers because the insurance carriers up here did not know how to handle these types of instances. So they were reaching out to Louisiana, Florida, and those adjusters were very laid back in nature, came up here, and people were highly taken advantage of for, for months to years, even further, all because they weren't getting remediated or mitigated properly. Whenever you're dealing with category three, that has to be removed ASAP. So when sewage backs up in a building, it's important to consider the health of workers and occupants. You have to communicate with your homeowner. I don't know how many times that I've gone into a situation where the homeowner was still staying in the room that had the damage. This is where you guys have to put on your I know more than you know hat, and you have to tell them, got to get out of here because you're only affecting your claim. Okay? Building occupants with compromised immune systems, respiratory problems, allergies, those that are less than two years of age, or the elderly, all should be people that be very cognizant of the dangers of Category 3 water. It's also recommended that the restorer consider the high risk situation utilizing the special PPE equipment that is necessary for them to work in a, a safe environment. So in situations where structural material and or contents have been heavily contaminated with such materials as pesticides, heavy metals, or toxic organic substances, the water is then considered to be category three sanitation. Now with category two, we said cushion and pad can be removed and the carpet can stay. I'm not a big fan of that, but we'll talk about that later. But in this instance of category three, all must be removed. That's why it's imperative for you to identify what category you're dealing with when you get on scene because that's the template of the type of mitigation that's gonna take place. So, regulated hazardous materials and mold. This is what happens when you don't act in time. If a regulated 
or hazardous material as part of a water damage restoration project, then a specialized expert may be necessary to assist in damage assessment and government regulations apply. Now we're talking EPA, guys. You get the EPA on your side, I guarantee an insurance carrier is not going to battle you for any instance when you're trying to maximize the claim for your client. So what are some regulated materials? Arsenic, mercury, lead-based paint, asbestos. I know a good company I can room back to. Uh, radiological residues, fuels, costly chemicals, mold in some locations. So when we're dealing with categories one, two, or three, time, is an enemy. So this will go back to the question that Robert had. So high valued area rugs, tapestries, they could all be things that had clean water on them, but if they were sitting for a while, now it goes from category one to then category two. Over 72 hours, now we're dealing with category three, but you're, you're telling the carrier it came from a broken pipe that was clean water. So this is why your information gathering is very important. So what are some major causes of water damage to create these category one, two, and three situations? Natural acts of God, which would contain flooding, heavy rains, hurricanes, mudslides, accidental neg negligence, which is still covered, lawn sprinkler systems. That's why when everyone says, oh, we had a cold winter, but we didn't have any pipes bursting. Be ready for when the folks start turning on their sprinkler systems in April and May. Because they, they may not have got their system blown out. And that water in there cracked that PVC. They go to turn on their sprinkler system. Now it's raining in their basement. So be prepared. We might have the weather might been just cold enough, but not cold enough to get all those burst pipes that we were hoping and praying for it, right? Now we get these first sprinkler systems. Defective appliances and fixtures. The clothes washer, the hot water heater, showers and bathtubs, toilets, faulty construction, leaky roofs, windows. Everyone know what ice damming is, correct? That's, these are things that can cause problems later on, but not right at the, right at the specific time. Now it's through water pipes. How many times the, the wife or the husband put something up and they put it right through. Now you got a little pinhole just leaking behind the wall. Next, next thing you know, a month later, little Tommy's leaning up. He's playing ball in the house with his sister and the ball gets stuck right in the drywall. Why is that drywall wet? Open it up. Turns out that pinhole has been leaking for quite some time. But you, as the representative, they just found out that now, that's how you articulate the claim. Is that clean water? Absolutely. But if it was leaking down from the second floor down into the main floor, down into the basement, now we're dealing with a different category of water, correct? Faulty construction, poor drainage, fire control suppression systems, frozen pipes, we've talked about that. And high humidity, believe it or not, if the HVAC system isn't working properly, and you see that sweat on the walls, if that's not taken care of the right way, that could cause problems, it could cause mold, it could cause all types of water damage. So these are things that we all have to be cognizant of. So while we're talking about categories of water, we need to know what primary, secondary, and hydroscopic damage is. The reason why I bring that up is because each affects different things that can help you document your claim. So what, what does everyone think the primary damage is? I'll, help, I'll let you off the hook. Primary damage is the damage that is caused directly by the flowing water. So like I use this example, can everyone see me? I'm not sure, but um, the water comes down, whatever touches that's wet, that's the primary damage. So this is damage that is directly caused by the flowing water, which contacts surfaces and contents within the affected area. 
antique furniture. That's the furniture that's on the floor. Draperies and upholstery because it's at floor level. Hardwood flooring. Particle board and plywood subflooring that can buckle, delaminate, or swell. That's all primary damage. Secondary damage is the damage that is caused not by direct contact with the flowing water, but when the relative humidity conditions are sustained above 60%. So that's when that HVA system is causing things to sweat. That's because the humidity in that area is above 60%. It's gonna cause the moisture in the air to turn into a liquid and then cause secondary damage. And there are two forms of secondary damage. Hydroscopic damage, which is materials that can readily take up and absorb the water and the water vapor from the air mass until they've reached an equilibrium, which means they're causing them to get wet. A good example of this is when the water in that room was caused by, say, a pipe, and the humidity level is very high, and you have a ceiling fan. And you see the wood panels of the ceiling fan all warped and hanging down. Now, did they get wet? No, but the family was away in Florida for a week or two. And you come in and you go to fight for that ceiling fan and the insurance carrier says, absolutely not. Just the floor was wet. What are you talking about? You need to know little ins and outs of the, the tricks of the trade, which is that ceiling fan was directly affected by the water damage. And because it was hot out, it was summertime, the family wasn't home, now you're getting your, your homeowner a ceiling fan because it was affected by that loss. And you utilize what's called hydroscopic damage to prove that. Another example is books on a shelf or particle board bookcases. They might be damaged on the bottom and you only can document that the water was four inches up on the wall. Then how did the top of the bookshelf get wet? The humidity in that room caused it to get wet, and now you can either get that bookshelf restored or replaced, preferably replaced. And these are things that, as a representative, show your homeowner your knowledge and your value as to why they should be hiring someone from Metro, because you guys are trained the best. When you could speak about those types of topics, that just puts that more validity into why they need to hire you at whatever percentage you are getting hired at. Now you are showing them your worth. Always be confident and always be ready to show people your worth. And the other type of damage, of course, is the big one. And that is fung fungal damage. And that's fung fung fungi and bacteria spores that germinate and multiply in an organic material. So when you have an RH level or humidity level above 60%, you're going to start seeing mold grow on the walls. You're going to start seeing mold grow on material that wasn't wet because they already have a food source because of the humidity. Now you have a mold claim as well. But you don't want to introduce it as a mold claim because now it went from a water endorsement to a mold endorsement. So you want to always stick to what got you there in the first place, which was the water loss. The things that I'm telling you are just for your own edification to maximize your claim. So when you get on scene, you, these are things that you're looking for. You're not just looking for your traditional, oh, the carpet's wet. Let's remove the carpet. Let's make a two foot flood cut and call it a day. There's so much more when you're dealing with the water loss. Well, hopefully they're talking to you first because unless they're an environmental hygienist, they don't know what they have. And I don't know is probably the most popular statement that you can ever make when you're dealing with a carrier for your client. You don't know, they can't deny the claim because you just don't know. That, yeah. So what's your, what's your, what's your, okay, so, okay, so, 
question was, question was what do you what say, do you say your, client your client calls you? Calls you. They obviously they had a water obviously loss had a water because water doesn't, come, this out doesn't come out of the sky. So his so question directly his question is, directly is phone call a phone call of, of I got mold. I got mold. Do you want how you, you want, want to answer, how you want to answer that? You want to get yourself, in, want the to get yourself in the door at that point. Let me get let there. Let me get there. And let me ascertain let me what exactly, what exactly, what it is. exactly it is. Let me use my expertise, let me use my expertise and my training. In my training. Because that mold, that mold that impacted, that impacted, like impacted, like impacted, impacted it hasn't been tested, hasn't been by, tested a hygienist, by a hygienist. It could be it could be aspergillus, or it could be, or it could be penicillin, penicillin inside, your inside your refrigerator. You don't know until don't know until, don't know until it's been tested. So, so I would stay away, from, would stay the away from the mold work until you know exactly, until you know exactly what you're dealing with. First and foremost, first and foremost second, second, I would want to find, want to find out, out the gate of skills, gate of skills to, find out where to find out where it got wet and, got wet. and how long and when the date of loss is. Go ahead, Robert. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Robert's question was, what if you're dealing with a row home situation and you're finding that there's impacted in your primary residence, could it have been from an upper or lower or side-by-side -side unit that because it's wet there and it's, it's warm, warmer than 60% humidity in the residence where you're going to, that could absolutely cause the impaction. Without getting into the neighboring units, very, very difficult. That's where you're going to have to use your investigative skills, get permission, uh, maybe find out. Most of the times, if you're dealing with a condo, it's, you're dealing with an HOA, you're, you're dealing with all different types of facets, but that's why you're getting paid the big bucks. You have to, you have to, you have to do some investigation. Not all, all of these are going to be clear and cut and dry, where you can walk in, oh, this is it. But you then now have to justify why this person is bringing you on board to represent them because you have to know your stuff. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And that's why you guys are in this class right now learning. Because once you know this or you partner up with a, a good vendor that can help you determine what's going on, and you'll find the source and you'll get the problem rectified. How are we doing with questions on this one? Yes. So the question is, do, do we test for mold and asbestos? We use a separate vendor for that because it could be a conflict of interest when it comes to post-testing. So in other words, we have the capabilities of, there are several individuals that we work with that come in and we'll take samples, air for mold, We'll take air and swab samples. For asbestos, we will take physical samples and we will then send it out to a lab, EMSL. They then give us the results back. And if those results come back positive, we then utilize that as a basis for either stopping the mitigation process, because then we now have to do containment. And then we have to operate the mitigation process properly with negative air, making sure it doesn't spread throughout the entire home or residence. Um, once that's done, this, the air monitor, if it's an asbestos or mold, we have a separate air monitor that comes in, does the post-testing, and they then tell us that the job is clean or 100% uh, uncontaminated, and then we can move forward from there. So. Basically, yes, we, we do the mitigation portion, but we, we have to go out to a separate vendor for the results and the testing. Yes, we do, exactly. So, so, so we do facilitate the whole process, but to make it better for your, your claim and the validating of your claim, we have two separate entities that are part of that process. But no, we wouldn't expect you to now have to go find someone else. We will handle it from start to finish for you. All right, so now we're on 
classes of water. And now, what the class of water is, it's the extent of water and how it relates to evaporation. So what that basically means is how fast does it absorb water and how fast does the water get taken out or the ability of it to be dried or removed. So when you go up to a claim, not only do you have to find out the source of the water or the category, you have to find out how much water is there. And this is also important when you're documenting your claim because now you're telling the carrier why, not only why you cut something out, but why, how much you cut out, if it, if that, if it comes down to that. So category one is basically what it says. It's the least amount of water absorption and evaporation load. Water losses that affect less than 5% of the combined floor, wall, and ceiling surfaces in a space where materials are described as high evaporation, middle absorption, and low evaporation materials and assemblies. Basically what that, in, in layman's terms, is this. We come in, water heater is over where PAM is. This whole room is 100%. So you walk over and it's only wet to about here on the carpet and maybe a little bit on the walls. That's about 5% or less of this whole room. So the way we would classify this, when you get here and you call me to come out and help mitigate, Troy, we got discharge of water from a water heater. What category of water is that? Category one. Yep, See. initially, initially. And that's if it, that, that's if, it happened that morning or the night before, which is nine times out of 10 when you guys are gonna get the call. Oh my God, this happened last night. I already got a plumber called, so forth and so forth. So now I know we got relatively clean water and it's not an extensive amount of damage. So that's class one. Class two is a significant amount of water absorption and evaporation load Water that loses the effect from 5% to 40%. So now you come in, water heater burst. Now the water is out to here. Affected all here. And now it's affected the baseboard trim and the drywall. Now we're at category, I mean, I'm sorry. We're at class two, category one, class two. Class three is the greatest amount of water absorption and evaporation load. Now we're dealing with 150 gallon water heater that not only did it blow, but it blew, it's gone. It emptied out all the water and ran for two days because the, sh the water wasn't shut off because the homeowners were in the Poconos at a training class for two days. Now they come in, they, as soon as they walk in that door, squish, squish, squish. And now we got padding that's going. We got lamination. It depends on what the, the, the floor source is. And we got water that's been sitting on all four corners of this room that need to be flood cut in order to dry properly. Now we're dealing with, is it category one or category two? Because it ran through all of this material on the floor. There was, it was in a, it was in an area that was a workshop and there's grease and oil and other contaminants on the floor. Now we're at, even though it came from that water heater, we're at minimum category two, potentially category three. Now we go back and we look at the water bill and we found out that the water bill in actually spiked six days before they came home. Now we're at category three because it was over 72 hours. Go ahead, Robert. The question is, 
for a flood cut, does plaster absorb the same way as drywall? It absolutely does. Yes, absolutely. Where do I have my mic? I don't know. It's around here somewhere. Let me um, get rid of this. Everybody knows who I am, correct? Hey, I'm not ashamed to admit it. Okay, we got, looks like we got about 13 minutes left, Maren. Okay, so we're moving right along nicely. I want to also leave some time for a question. Now, the, the category that is the hardest to understand is the category four, I mean, sorry, the, the class that is hardest to understand is the class four, because there, it, it doesn't matter the amount of water. It could be signified as a class one being 5% or, or, or less or 5% or more. Now we're dealing with the type of material for class four. You're gonna get class four, it's a deeply held or bound water, meaning it's hard to, absorb the water but once it absorbs it it stays in there and it's very hard to dry and you're going to find things like that with um, a, a significant amount of water absorption into low evaporation materials there you go so we're talking about um, extremely low permeance or porosity so it means it 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 takes longer for the water to absorb Okay, uh, we're, we're talking about hardwood, plaster, brick, concrete, stone, ground, water, things that happen in ground, and hardwood. These are things that you don't want to just go in there and tear out. Unless, of course, they're, they're, have, they're visibly damaged, like when you see delamination, buckling, um, things that happen where it's beyond repair. Particle board is one of those things. You have, you get, someone's got cabinets and it's particle board. Insurance carriers try to fight this all the time. This cannot be dry because it's, it's already destroyed. That would be your class four identification. So if you already put on your paperwork, class four, and is documented, then your mitigation company comes in and cooperates with you, what you're saying, and then it's removed. I would still take pictures of it. I would still stage it, but they're gonna have a very hard time because you did your homework and you documented it properly. I always get, oh, I got accidental discharge, come in and rip it, rip it out, rip it apart. How about now that you've taken this class, Troy, we got, Category two, class three. Now, now you're using the proper verbiage and you're using the proper documentation. You got the right mitigation company coming in. Now you get your insurance, you, you get your client and your insured covered a lot easier. Because I'm telling you right now, a lot of carriers are being a little bit more stringent. They're asking for dry logs, they're asking for pictures. And don't just take a picture of the wet. Come in, squish, 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 take a picture of the whole room. Then go take a picture of the source, take a picture with your moisture meter up close so they can read it. Don't just take a picture with your hand on it, take a picture so they can see. So depending on what type of moisture meter you have, if it shows green, yellow, red, make sure they can see it. If it shows a percentage on it, make sure they can see that percentage. Then leave the moisture meter there, step back, take a picture of the moisture meter in front of that area. So there's no ambiguity whatsoever of where it was wet, why it was wet, and why did you call somebody in to mitigate for that reason. 
I called a mitigation company in because it was category two, class three. Now, this is where the water source came from. And it's category three because I found this, this, and this on the, on the building material. Or it's category three because my client was away and we found out from a neighbor that they saw water coming out Tuesday, it's now Saturday. And we're just now getting to it because of this. The neighbor was able to turn the water off, but no one could physically get in the home until after 72 hours. Now they can't argue the fact that it's category three. These are going to be some things you're going to get with your client, but you need to show them how important you are. Delayed action, customer's attitude. They can do it themselves. It's a small area. Competitive pressures. Everyone does it, so there's no difference. Financial reasons. I believe we got slow because of COVID. Honestly, people aren't ready to put that money out or they're not ready to wait to get paid because they're, they're struggling right now. You need to overcome these things because there's no greater benefit than all of you in this room to be able to help a client. All they hear is percentages and this, that, and the other thing. But when you start talking to them with real life experience and knowledge as opposed to speculation and guessing, you know what, maybe I do need you. Maybe this is above my pay grade. Does anyone have any questions? All right, uh, I guess Pam, uh, open it up to some questions while we can. Yes. Depending, the roof leak, I would always go to category two because you don't know what's in that roof material and you don't know where it's originating from down into where it infiltrated. So my let them tell me that it's category one. I, that, that's where, those are one of those things where that's, to me, that's an easy argument. Just as, just as long as you make it a, make sure it's considered a one-time event and not something that's been ongoing, to make sure you know that it occurred on such and such date when that wind rainstorm happened, or else you're going to find yourself in a, in a bind. Okay. Okay, so the, the, the question that was asked is determining the types of wood. Uh, it could, it most likely the wood that occurred had a very high absorption level. So it although it buckled, the water made it buckle because it was between the subfloor and the flooring. And before it actually damaged the wood, it displaced the wood. Once the moisture came, came out, the wood went back down. That doesn't happen often though. That doesn't happen often at all. So they actually got lucky. But if you, if you act in a timely manner, you may not be able to save the cabinets, but proper dehumidification and air movement could save the floors before they get so I, with, with hardwood, I always err the side of caution because you start cutting wood out just because and you can't then articulate, you may have just caused your client some, some bad times ahead. So that's why you got to make sure the medication company knows what they're doing because if you try and dry it and it's still damaged, now you have documentation. We, we tried 
Same thing with, uh, in another class, we can talk about this, but fire and smoke. The carpet obviously has contaminants in it, but we tried to clean it. We didn't just go and rip it out first. But that's all about maintaining and validating the claim and helping your client to its fullest. Do we have any other questions? All right, hey, look, uh, we got another night tonight. Uh, we have tomorrow. I will be at the table up, up top. Um, CPR is doing a raffle for three separate gift cards. So if you have further questions or you didn't think about something, stop at the table. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, all, I'm walking all around. I'm trying to sit at the table as much as possible while I'm here by myself. But if you have any questions, um, grab a business card, even if it's not a claim. Um, several members in this room know. Call me. Uh, I'm, I'm full of a lot of knowledge. I have a lot of experience. And I'm not just somebody up here talking. Yes, that's important. And I learned policy over the years. I learned it from seeing what works and what doesn't work. And I learned things that you don't say back up, you say clear it an obstruction. These, it's not anything fraudulent. It's just once you know what the carrier does and doesn't accept, it can make you a lot more powerful as a claim rep and hopefully an adjuster soon. Thank you, I appreciate that. But if that's it, I guess we can call it. You guys got enough time in here to get the CE credit, so I appreciate you all. I appreciate your questions and your attention. All right. Thank you.